Um, today we have Dr. Bouchard Amin, who will be um, speaking about using mass spectrometry to explore small molecules. She comes from Professor Robinson's lab in the Department of Chemistry, where she works on the application of um, proteomic technologies using mass spectrometry in aging and age-related disorders in worms and humans. So, Dr. Amin. Thank you so much, Carrie, for uh, the introduction. And I'm very grateful um, to the library for uh, organizing this uh, opportunity uh, of giving postdoc, um, having some kind of teaching experience. And um, I am Bushra Amin, as uh, Carrie introduced me. Um, I uh, work with Professor Rena Robinson in chemistry department, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the use of mass spectrometry in order to explore the small molecules. Before I start the talk, I would go um, to introduce my uh, great group, um, my colleagues who are um, extraordinarily supportive, and we are very pleasing um, and diverse group. Um, our lab is basically uh, studying the mechanism of age-related diseases, um, particularly Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are learning in focus, and um, we apply proteomic technology with the help of mass spectrometry to um, question the biological, um, to answer the biological questions. Um, as far as the diversity of our group concern. We are having people from uh, various backgrounds. Uh, they are from neuroscience, uh, biology, as well as uh, um, chemists and other um, um, fields of uh, 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 throughout the campus. So what does uh, Raster stand for? Uh, it's the initials of uh, Professor Rene A. S. Robinson. So it's her oh, name. Uh, okay. Initials. Um, in addition to this, um, um, we are also a part of Pittsburgh uh, mass spec um, community that include bio MS facility and others as well. Um, we mainly apply mass spec to, uh, for the proteomic uh, analysis um, to look what is the involvement of periphery uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Also in uh, we are having some studies with uh, sepsis in elderly patient uh, and uh, age-related um, uh, health disparities. Dr. Robinson uh, is very actively involved in collaboration, interdepartmental and um, uh, within uh, uh, different groups uh, of chemistry department as well as we are associated with other national laboratories or institutes. Now, what we are going to discuss today, I will have a very brief uh, overview of what mass spec is and um, its major component, how we are using it, um, diverse uses of mass spec in uh, uh, various fields. Um, then I will directly jump over proteomics as this is our major focus. And in proteomics, I'm going to talk about classical and uh, uh, mass spec based approaches. Then I will talk in quantitative uh, proteomic approach, uh, uh, some of my ongoing project, uh, which I'm working with. Um, so um, mass spec is basically helping us, uh, or is a method of uh, analytical tool that give us the measurement of uh, mass of a molecule. And being as a fundamental property, uh, we can use this or exploit this uh, measurement to identify that molecule or its structure or uh, some kind of substitution in the structure or modification. It's not a new technique. Uh, going behind a uh, century later, Professor Thompson has uh, initiated uh, with the great de demonstration of uh, existence of electron. Then his student has uh, um, taken the lead and invented the first mass spectrograph uh, where he has uh, shown that the positive and negative ion in the gas rays are being measured in the mass spec. Now, um, what are the basic components? Uh, if we are um, seeing that there are three major or the basic components in each mass spectrometer, 
um, so the ionization source where the vaporized uh, sample is uh, in, uh, going in through inlet. And once the sample get ionized uh, in the source, ions are pushed towards analyzers. And uh, uh, analyze is separating the ions according to their mass to charge ratio. And um, then the signals are generated through uh, transducer. Um, the, all three uh, major components are being um, being uh, being kept under a very uh, high vacuum, uh, so the pressure is normally kept uh, up to minus eight torr, uh, which is minimizing the possibility that uh, your ions are not going to collide in between, and also with the gas molecules, uh, and they can generate uh, the useful information for us uh, about elemental composition, isotopic composition qualitative and quantitative structural information as well. As far as the application of uh, mass spec are concerned, so um, it's everywhere from biology to geology. Um, the most um, remarkable application, I would say, um, is uh, to look for the mutation in the DNA. Uh, we can look uh, by using a direct mass spec approach or can follow the indirect approach by you separating the DNA um, by gel and then uh, cut out that particular uh, uh, DNA part and can look for its mutation or its product. It's there in ph pharmacy and also in uh, nature product uh, and, uh, to separate the uh, molecule which can be used as a drug. Also, by um, studying the steroid, uh, it's in uh, games or the athletic field where uh, we can look for doping uh, in the athletes. Sorry, did you say that um, you're using it to look at DNA mutations mm -hmm. versus doing sequencing? How do you use mass spec to look at sequence information? Uh, so there are databases um, in, uh, about DNA gene genome sequences there, and uh, once the sequence is uh, like for proteins we are doing, so we are also doing for DNA as well, and then it is compared with the normal sequence and uh, the mutated um, part of the genome you can detect easily. And how does that compare, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. how does that compare with uh, just the routine sequencing techniques that are um, it's uh, It's the same method, I would say, but the databases are different, plus the algorithm is also different. So for DNA, it's different type of software we use. Uh, also, there are um, uh, products which are like uh, genome sequences, which are commercially available. Uh, you are also adding those sequences as uh, internal standard or so to say your um, reference and with that you can compare as well by looking into the fragmentation. So mass spec is also uh, one of the uh, top three instrument which is which has been sent already on Mars. Uh, it's the photo has been taken from a NASA project uh, uh, which is a space exploration and mainly it is in use for surface analysis or the um, uh, uh, composition of uh, element or the element detection uh, present on the Mars surface. Um, Mars spec was, uh, is also uh, being used to use uh, in pet petroleum industry as well as for the uh, blue water horizon. So there was a massive uh, oil spill and uh, along with the gas chromatograph, mass spec is also the leading instrument which, uh, which is in uh, use to look for which uh, compound has been spread and how to get rid of them. Um, not only this, uh, anti-terrorism and defense activity. So um, the instrument which has been developed by Smith Detection, it's uh, very often used. It is basically ion scan mass spectrometer which is uh, on airport and other uh, places uh, has been installed and you can easily 
is getting explosive in our cortex. Then in general, it's not all, but a few of them that even in the food industry for food quality, water quality, contamination, toxins, as well as uh, remaining traces of the gases in here, uh, people are using it. Petroleum industry is very famous. Muspec was already well developed there. In clinics, uh, most likely the biomarker uh, development or the signatures and all kind of uh, basic building blocks of uh, life. So uh, from lipids to carbohydrate and oligonucleotides in biotechnology, we are using it. Now, I will go towards proteomics as we are mainly working with that uh, field. And uh, whenever I am talking with um, other people and they ask which field you belong to, um, and I reply to proteomics and they say, what proteomics is? We know chemistry or physics, but <laughs> we never heard about proteomics. So um, um, the proteomics is basically um, the study of all proteins present in any given uh, sample that can be cell, that can be tissue, that can be organ or uh, uh, a small organelle um, inside the cell. And uh, Professor um, Tao, belonging to Purdue um, uh, University, he made this uh, nice cartoon that using the traditional way biochemical approaches, when you are trying to identify or um, target a specific uh, one single target, proteomic approach can help you and can give you a broader aspect. You can look at the same time and in, even in shorter time and low cost. Uh, multiple target that can be involved in a particular uh, disease stage or a condition. So um, proteomics is basically um, composed or comprised of various approaches. There are classical way uh, of proteomic. When I started to do that, that was 2D page and 2D dyage uh, that came up. Then, um, of course, uh, there are some limitation and the drawbacks of this field. So further development has been through the, uh, during this time, and people start working towards more and more direct mass spectrometry based approaches. There are protein and antibody arrays, uh, or assays are there, uh, with which you can specifically target uh, multiple protein that can be up to 100 or even more. As well, you can look for the uh, um, proteome wide coverage uh, by using a specific antibody if the antibodies has already been developed. If antibody is not been developed for all the proteins in a system you are looking for, then of course these kind of arrays are not useful. 2D page, which is two dimensional um, polyacrylamide gel, gel electrophoresis, is basically an advancement um, of the traditional um, one-dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gel. What uh, we are doing over there, that proteins are separated first according to their charge. So um, from acidic to the basic range, first you can separate the protein according to their isoelectric point, and once their um, uh, isoelectric point come, the protein become um, stable over there, I mean, uh, it cannot move after that. There is no more charge uh, attraction for this. And once the proteins are separated according to their charge, you can place that uh, separated protein on the top of um, one dimensional gel and can separate according to the molecular weight. So um, PET has uh, um, published this method in 75. And uh, the benefit for this that compared to one dimensional uh, gel, you, you are now having better separation, so you can see up to 1,000 protein. Um, also, um, I mean, it's it was much uh, better uh, visualization because in one lane, it was not so easy to see if one band can be more than 10 protein or even more. So it was supposed to be the uh, comparatively better separation. However, some limitation exists. Um, so each sample you has to process separately, has to analyze separately, and now there are two dimensions, so you have to 
do more work plus there are so much variation so more handling so more variation plus run to run uh, uh, variability exists um, then the Deitch pop-up which is differential gel electrophoresis um, which I'm going to talk uh, in the next slide. Can I just ask you, um, is the 2D page a uh, denaturing uh, type of gel? Uh, it's uh, it worked in both native condition and the denaturating condition as well. It depends that uh, while you are focusing the protein, are you adding denaturative agent over there or not? So you can have, you can have both. Mm -hmm. okay. I worked with both. So um, then this was the technique which I have used during my uh, doctoral time and I have reported um, biomarkers for neurodegenerative disease using this method. Um, the technique over here is that you are using fluorescent dyes and these fluorescent dyes are basically um, having different excitation wavelengths. So the structure remains same, but the um, they are um, give, uh, giving the fluorescence at different wavelengths. You can label your protein. These are amine reactive dyes. So um, primary amines at the protein level, you can bind. Uh, with this uh, method, also there is a, a variation of this method exists, which is called minimal labeling. Uh, minimal labeling means you are only providing very few amount of this dye so that one to two molecule of fluorescent dyes attached per protein. Um, and why this came up? Because people were complaining that uh, this uh, dye is a heavy molecule, so it actually increasing the molecular weight of the protein. And they don't want the artificial increase in the weight, so. Uh, that's why they, they made this minimal uh, dye labeling method. So now the advantage is you can label two different samples with two different variation of this heavy dye, can mix them together. Also, you can use one-to-one uh, -one mixture of both samples and can use it as internal standard by labeling it with another side dye or another variation of this. Combine everything together in one-to-one -one ratio and then run in the same way like we do uh, 2D gel electrophoresis. Do you do a crosslink, or how do you get the label on each sample, and then when you combine them, they don't uh, cross? Uh, OK, so or? we are quenching um, the extra dye. So as it is amine reactive, and once you are done, labeling is pretty fast and complete within, I think, maximum one hour. And after that, you add a uh, primary amine containing buffer. So remaining dye molecule, if they are there, they are being utilized by dress or any other thing. So there is no possibility that when you combine, they are going to cross react. So uh, you separate them uh, in the same way, first dimension according to charge, second dimension according to their size. And now you can uh, record the image at different wavelength and then you can overlay all three wavelength to see uh, differential expression of the protein. So uh, if you will see here uh, psi 3 which is red in color so if you are labeling one sample with red and the other sample with um, uh, blue or the green color so let's say green color then it shows the red spots are showing you all the protein which are overexpressed in sample one. Green spots are showing that these are the protein which are overexpressed in sample two. And if there is a yellowish color, these are equally present in both samples. So these are non-changeable uh, protein or they, they remain the same. Um, and this was the advan uh, advancement a couple of years ago when I was working because it was really, it is really too much work <laughs> and uh, for especially I work with the human plasma and human plasma is really very complex sample. Um, though I um, deplete the high abundant protein using 
top 20 depletion column so this is one of the approach um, if there is abundant protein what they are doing they are masking the signal of other protein which are coming into the same mass uh, range so you can remove those protein and um, these are the antibody based column you can uh, work with this the cheapest possibility to remove these abundant protein which is mainly albumin is nine, uh, up to 80 uh, or 90 percent of the uh, whole plasma protein uh, cibacron blue columns are also there which are just blue dye and it is specifically attached to albumin this is the cheapest most way so once the albumin is there you will see really hundreds of protein more on your 2d gel um, but um, to make a clean nice gel and to get a better result of course you are working with top 6 top 10 top 12 or 20 uh, protein to remove them that is the idea um, and there are companies that will do this is the idea that uh, once you identify a um, you know a novel change to so red or, or depending on what your interest was uh, then you can actually excise mm -hmm. that part from the gel and then uh, submit it for uh, protein identification protein, for identification mm -hmm. this is true absolutely so it is um, just for uh, that you can see variation but you cannot see by 2d dye that which protein it is so you are obliged to use um, or to connect this method to an identification method which is of course in our case must be um, and, and this is all none of this is proteolized it's uh, these are the macromolecules yes okay. this can be single protein this can be a uh, combination or the conjunction of many proteins so they can be coupled protein as well depending on whether it's denatured or mm -hmm. so either if you are doing native protein then everything is in native format uh, there can function, be sure. yes um, the only limitation we found while working with this that protein of course lose their solubility because at isoelectric point protein tends to precipitate and once they are precipitated during first dimension, their movement is poor or almost no during second dimension. So what this makes, if your protein is 50 kilodalton, but at pH 6.5, it precipitate. So it is not going to move down till the um, 50 kilodalton part in your gel. It will be somewhere on the top or uh, also blocking the movement of other proteins. Then the other thing, which is proteins of very high and low uh, pH, you can lose them. Why? Because your um, isoelectric focusing uh, strips or the gel are normally pH 3 to 10. Um, and at extreme ends, you are always placing uh, uh, wetting paper to cool down the electrodes so that gel are not burned during that time. So basically, if you are using 3 to 10 pH range, you are only looking from 5 to 8 because the ends are always damaged. Also, very high uh, molecular weight protein, uh, you will not see better separation or um, they only stay on the top of the gel. Protein identification in each spot, it's pretty slow process because you have to pick them, you have to cleave them by using proteolytic enzyme, then you have to uh, place them into um, LC for separation and uh, into mass it Also, a spot picking uh, can be very uh, challenging for you because it's a fluorescent gel which you cannot see by eye. So you have to work under scanner or you need to use a robotic uh, where it is automatically set the position and it can pick for you. How common is uh, R2D uh, dyes um, now in the era of mass spectrometry? Um, since when I am in this group, I never worked with them. But still I know many groups who are working with that because it has its own advantage. Let's say if I am interested in 
a certain post translational modification mark stack is not it can also show me but did, uh, 2d gel or 2d dyes can show me all isoform on the gel uh, when the isoelectric point is changed due to certain modification so it is still a method of choice depending what your goal is um, yeah and uh, individual spot can contain many protein or a protein or many isoform whatever because you have combined many samples so uh, it's going to be more complex now um, of course people want to uh, have easy approaches in their life or they want that not more trouble <laughs> so mass spectrometry which is direct analysis you don't need to bother for any kind of separation or sample preparation. Um, there are different approaches in the mass spec as well. So uh, top down, bottom up, middle down as well or middle up as well. Uh, top down meaning you are starting from protein level. And then you are fragmenting directly the protein within the mass spec into its fragment by providing the energy so the protein is going to break into the peptide whatever modification it is going to have modifications will be there then you can look for the most uh, uh, the, the uh, protein peak which contains most of the modification you are going to fragment it and the benefit is you are going to have the whole sequence coverage in terminal you will detect, C terminal you will detect, in all isoform with the modification you will detect. However, with complex mixture, you cannot follow this approach because it will be really difficult to look for which peptide, only 20 amino acids are there and millions of proteins are there, so one peptide can match too many proteins. And you need to have a very purified, clean protein that you can work with. Bottom-up approach is very famous and most commonly used uh, as the name shows that we are starting from the bottom part of it, meaning we need to convert first protein into peptide by using proteolytic enzyme. We can discuss how we are converting the peptide, though it's pretty easy. Um, then the peptide we are introducing to ionize and then go into the mass spec. Um, you can select the peptide of your interest, either you are going for top 7 analysis, only most intense peak you want to analyze, or top 20 or you want to fragment all the peaks. Once you have making the isolation or if you are interested in a particular peptide with certain modification or an epitope of uh, antigen, um, then you can select that one and can break them. So the uh, benefit is that it's easy to work with, um, you can work with any kind of complex sample, any mixture, because you are going to look uh, with your targeted peptide or the sequence. However, protein coverage is going to be very poor because, of course, after proteolysis, it depends on the individual sequence of a protein. You can have very long peptide, you can have very small peptide, or maybe a single amino acid, and of course, that mass range we are not covering during our the, uh, full scan. So, um, bottom-up approach, we are converting protein into peptide. Most common proteolytic enzyme, we are using trypsin, which is having a specific um, cleavage activity, um, always selectively cleaving at the carboxy end of lysine and arginine. The only exception is if the proline is the next amino acid, then of course uh, trypsin doesn't work. Typical length of a triptych peptide is going to be um, four to uh, six, uh, six to fourteen amino acid. But again, it depends on um, if it is a very basic protein, meaning more lysine and arginine is going to be there. So more smaller peptide we are going to get. <clears throat> this is just an example to show how we are breaking the peptide or how we are determining the sequence of a peptide. So if we are having a peptide, we are providing or letting it to collide with energetic gas molecule that is breaking the amide bond. And each 
uh, bond when it is cleaved, uh, each amino acid is going to produce a, a signal. And the signal will uh, directly correlate with the mass of that amino acid sequence. So um, the B ions are always containing N-terminal sequence of a peptide and the um, mass of amino acid directly shows the sequence of that peptide. However, for Y ion, it is containing the information about carboxy terminal of a peptide and um, it also mass is directly related. Also with the ions, B and Y ions, you can specifically detect modification if certain residue is residing on a amino acid side, you can uh, have the amino acid mass with the increment of that modification. Overall spectra um, or the fragmentation spectra is looking like with the B and Y ion mainly, but we have other fragment ions which is um, that carbon-carbon bond breaks as well, or we can also get noise or interfering molecule. So um, after we are having our fragmented uh, mass spec or MS2 spectra, we are always going to search this experimental value to theoretical masses which are present in databases. These databases can be taken from uh, SwissProd or XPASI or wherever the uh, database sources are present. Most likely your winter, uh, mass spec winter is providing you the software um, and certain databases are already there, but if it is not there or you are working with a special worm or a species, then you can download uh, from SwissProd. Um, that databases contain the masses, theoretical masses, and you compare your experimental masses to theoretical masses and look for the parent protein. So we started from peptide and going back towards protein that shows the spot amount approaches. Now, moving towards quantitative protein proteomic. So all these approach, either it is 2D gel, 2D dye, or direct mass spectrometry, it is going to give you identification. But you cannot have that how much of my protein or the peptide is present? Can I just ask, um, if you were to do the 2D page or PIG, um, uh, how do you do the ID? Is that also based on mass spec that you mm -hmm. have? Okay, so ultimately it goes back to mass spec. Yes. Okay. Or you can, if you are working with a target protein, you can use a reference protein and can also load it um, during isoelectric focusing. So with this reference mass, you can presume, okay, this is going to be my albumin or whatever. But it is a um, dependent method. You need to have an identification technique. Now, to look for uh, quantification of a protein, most likely relative quantification because you are going to compare amount or the quantity of one peptide or protein to other peptide. There are several approaches. Uh, one of them is label-free. If you analyze your sample, each individual sample separately, but you need to keep each and every condition same. So from preparation until data evaluation, all condition need to be same. And then you can compare the intensity of the peptide or protein by looking into peak area. That is called label-free uh, quantification approach. It's cost-effective because you are not buying expensive uh, label, however, very laborious and uh, more prone to handling errors. Alternative of this is SILEC or stable isotope labeling where you are introducing heavy amino acid to growing cells in the uh, media. So now your two different cells or two different uh, condition, when they are, cells are multiplicating, the uh, cells which are having heavy amino acid, they are going to incorporate heavy amino acid into their protein uh, synthesis during translation. Afterwards, 
after four or five cycles, cell cycles, you can, um, it's nearly 100% incorporation of heavy amino acid, then you can combine the both sample together, can process them together, and can analyze them together as well. So, um, though these amino acids are pretty expensive, plus you are using a lot of them because you are providing as a media, as a source, basic source of their carbon chain. So it's pretty expensive technique, but it helps you to reduce variation, plus uh, minimizing the labor as well. And, and is this just for uh, culture use? It's only for it? cell culture. So um, any other kind of sample, um, tissue or the plasma or... You can feed it to an animal. Mm -hmm. practical. Mm -hmm. And is this uh, like a carbon isotope? Yes. Uh, labeled amino acid? Mm -hmm. So mostly people are using uh, lysine or lysine and arginine as well. Um, only arginine with six heavy carbon in combination with um, six heavy carbon plus four heavy nitrogen is also very famous uh, in silica. So there are variation which uh, people can select according to which particular protein they are interested in. Then there are isotopic labeling method, where is basically a small molecule or the chemical that are primary amino specific, and you can label your peptides or any sample. So this can be a peptide or protein that are coming from a cell culture or this can be patient material. And uh, you can, uh, but you are not labeling them right from the beginning. You are labeling them once you are at peptide level. So you, uh, after labeling, you uh, again, you are quenching to remove the excess label, and then you can combine them together, you can process them together. So uh, example of isotopic labeling is dimethylation where you are adding a uh, dimethyl group um, at the amino end, either terminal end or the lysine epsilon group. So this is to your sample itself? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, again, it is uh, um, giving you an opportunity that you can mix more sample and can analyze them together. Then there are isobaric tags, which are, as name suggests, isobaric. These are set of 10 up to 12 tags having nearly same mass but different heavy isotope composition. So this allows to combine up to 10 to 12 samples into one single run. And again it is amino specific tags so they are binding to the primary amine and you can quench them, mix them together, clean them together and can analyze them together as well. And uh, Reporter ion, sequence, uh, reporter ion uh, intensity is showing you the individual variation, uh, the protein among different samples you have combined. So, sorry, what's the principle behind the isobaric tagging? Um, the principle is that uh, you are having the same molecule which is going to attach with your uh, peptide but they are varying most likely by one Dalton mass uh, with the incorporation of a heavy isotope into that one. So um, when we move further, I will show you that how we okay, are So it's just another type of isotope labeling except it's, it allows for multiple mm -hmm. samples. And other than this technique, uh, there are uh, further advancement as well. So you can combine isotopic labeling with silic in order to uh, have more um, uh, channels available, or it's from Dr. Robinson uh, or our group that we have combined isotopic and isobaric labeling together, and we can analyze up to 24 samples at the same time. And uh, this is the way that we um, use the pH to direct isotopic labeling only towards intermini and isobaric and lysine section. Now, why we need to do this multiplexing or mixing of many samples? So, uh, suppose we are working with larger clinical cohort or wanted to analyze 
uh, differences in among pa po patient population or biological replicate we want to study, then we need to um, see the variation or the change among all these patients or your patient population. And if you will follow label-free approach over here, it's a lot of work and a lot of sample preparation and then analysis. So quite much time it is going to consume. Also, if you want to see multiple tissue or the organ from the same patient, um, let's suppose you are working with six different organs, and if you are looking for 100 different patients, it all automatically becomes 600 samples for you, and you definitely need more replicates as well. So it's going to make the life so difficult. Um, there, uh, the multiplexing or the quantitative uh, approaches uh, helps us to minimize the handling. You can reduce the acquisition time, also most likely the cost and labor, which is, I mean, uh, in short time you can get an uh, interesting result if you can compare them all together. My part of the project is to look for new labels or the tag. So uh, we are mainly interested in amino specific tags and why we are interested because the reaction to primary amine is highly specific and almost complete as well. You can identify any peptide present in your sample which is labeled at primary amine. So all of the peptide which has been labeled you can directly identify that. Of course, with the label, you are going to get better identification and quantification data. You uh, Labeling of at primary mean is not going to hurt you if you have sensitive modification or um, base labile modification like phosphorylation or others. There are several tags available. Uh, first of all, you can work with any kind of sample. You can label any kind of sample. You are not obliged to work with only cell, uh, cell culture or so. Um, and it is suitable to all kind of separation techniques as well. There are sulfo links, or they are also called easy links, which is uh, containing biotin. <coughs> so you can label your protein with um, NHS, which is going to bind with, of course, primary amine. You can enrich all those proteins because it contains biotin. So you can use evidin uh, tag and can enrich all the peptides and can get rid of all unlabeled sample or all non-interesting sample. There are uh, hydroxysuccinamide esters. There are um, formaldehyde, which we are using already in our dimethylation isotopic label. This is one of the uh, chemical I am using for reversible labeling, uh, malic anhydride. And these are the isobaric tags, which we talk about. So isobaric tag is basically composed of three components. One is a main reactive component. Then in between, there is a small linker, which we are calling balancer. And then there is the reporter ion. Once your peptide is attached over here with, once it is labeled with isobaric tag, it is going to have the decomposition. And in 10 or 12 flex or 12 different variation, only one ion is changing in the balancer. Um, now one ion is changing in reporter and other are changing in balancer part. So that you, when you are going to do fragmentation, using HCD and you will have the reporter ion, only one of the uh, heavy isotope will be present there because balancer is not going to come over there. So in this way, the 12 different sample or 10 different sample you have mixed together, you can see them clearly with the shift of one mass. Is the I-track, hmm? so the term I-track, is that um, a type of isobaric label? Mm -hmm. It is relative quantification of uh, isotopically labeled uh, peptides. And ITRAC is maximum, I believe, coming with the eight plex. So eight different variations are there. However, for uh, TMT, it is 10 plex. 
and there are dye new labels as well which is dimethylated leucine that that are 12 plus so i started working with hydroxy succinamide ester which is already published for protein labeling and we want to use it at peptide level but not for all primary amine however only for n terminal amine so um, my project was that can we direct it only towards n terminal amine but not towards the lysine side chain and um, it is very easy to work with labeling is almost complete at uh, neutral to basic ph uh, it, it is labeling the um, amino group completely and again it is suitable to all kind of sample and separation method so uh, my part of the project was how we can achieve n terminal labeling by using this hydroxy succinamide ester and also if we can develop some new tags so is to start with the first part i have designed an experiment to look for or uh, to direct this tag only for n terminal side um, i explain uh, i i plan it that why we shouldn't go for ph exploitation so we know that at acidic ph um, the pka value for n terminal amine is low compared to lysine side chain so at acidic ph only n terminal amine is deprotonated and ideally only it should attack as a uh, active nucle uh, nucleotide nucleophile to uh, attach with the nhs i have made different ph point from 1 to 10.5 uh three replicates for each of the 20 ph point we have made i have made the labeling one hour and then did the quenching peptides were separated on a c18 a reverse phase collar and then analyzed on uh, orbitrally and data was evaluated with a protein discoverer what we found was as expected that at lower ph if we follow the uh, blue line the labeling only for n terminal is pretty high which is nearly up to 95% or higher the tag we can only direct towards n terminal however with the increase of ph so if we reach towards neutral to basic ph more and more lysine is going to attach but n terminal are not going to attach these are the two uh, ms ms spectra which are showing that at low ph our compound or the molecule is highly specific only to label n terminal amine and we got uh, we get very good fragmentation almost complete uh, peptide we have detected all ions however if we increase the ph and remaining all other conditions same that our compound is binding to both amine then the next question was that is this labeling is efficient or not meaning that if i am having 100 peptides how many of the peptide i can label with this so almost the same experiment i have performed however this time i used uh, different acid and bases to make the ph why because we wanted to see that maybe due to different acid we can get better ionization or a stable um, ph that can keep our n terminal deprotonated all the time during the reaction and the results which we were uh, which we got was um, not as we were expecting actually because at acidic ph we see only a uh, um, very strong acidic ph labeling efficiency is up to 20%. So out of 100 peptide only 20 peptides are labeled. However, as we are going beyond with the uh, pH, we reach up to 93%. So out of um, 100 93 peptides has been labeled with the increase of pH. But at increase of pH it is not terminal specific. It is at both sides. Then we have tested that Uh, maybe molar excess can help us to increase the labeling efficiency 
but we didn't find it significantly uh, related with the uh, labeling of the peptide plus uh, longer reaction time and maybe more cycles can help improve our labeling up to 100%. I would conclude over here this part that we found that labeling is highly reproducible. However, at lower pH, it is specific to N-terminus but with a poor efficiency. And with the increase of uh, pH, we get better labeling, um, but it is uh, present at both sides. Uh, molar excess doesn't um, reflect uh, the labeling efficiency directly. However, uh, maybe longer reaction time and cycle can help, but uh, these reactions uh, are under uh, on are ongoing. So at the moment, I don't have result with this. Uh, how long? Do you have Okay. Um, <laughs> next part I'm going to skip and I would go directly to, we are having the other approach uh, with the development of new tags. So um, what we are doing, we are uh, actually derivatizing a small molecule and then um, um, doing the same kind of experiment to see that if we can only label them uh, at N-terminal site. So with the second part where we have did the new development, we found that it is a comparatively faster reaction. Nearly half an hour, we get complete uh, labeling. Um, tenfold excess of our new tag is efficient enough to provide us complete labeling. However, uh, labeling at protein level at the moment has bothered us a little bit because if we label all lysine side chain protein get precipitated. It has no more charge available that it can remain soluble in the system. And this part we have figured out that by the addition of a small detergent, protein can still be soluble and then we can pro, uh, process further. Other optimization with this is ongoing and I would like to thank um, for the cooperation and support of all my colleagues, especially my professor, uh, Dr. Robinson, um, Christina and Caitlin both are here with me. So thank you very much for uh, both of you uh, being here. Uh, the project is supported by um, R01 brand from NIH. And I would like to thank my department and so all of you for listening to me of one hour. If you have questions, you are welcome to ask. Thank you. Questions? Well, I mean, uh, I suppose one question. So, you mentioned the limitations of um, the uh, earlier, you know, proteomic techniques for identification. Um, and one of them was uh, the size of uh, the protein that you can detect. I think it was less than um, 20 kilo, 10, 20 dollars. Mm, le Dalton. Less than 10 Dalton, uh, depending on which composition of gel you are using. Less than 10 Dalton. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested... Uh, oh, that's pretty small. It's a small, but it's still uh, polypeptides. You cannot get it. So you okay. are getting only a given set of information, but not the complete uh, information. Plus, um, most of the protein which are higher than 10 ki uh, 100 kilo Dalton that you can also not capture in the same protein until and unless you are using a special kind of gradient gel. So you can collect both the smaller and the bigger protein at the same time in one gel. So I guess my question is, why do, uh, very general though, why do people separate proteomics from uh, the science of um, identifying really small proteins that are under 1,500 uh, Dalton, and they call it metabolomics. It seems like it's the same concept, and why You why are right. I, um, when I was working with metabolomic, it was very clear. Only metabolites we are detecting via metabolomics, not the polypeptide or the small peptide. They are still uh, they should be actually categorized as proteomic, not the metabolomic. 
until and unless they are the degradative product of a certain process or a um, disease reaction or a drug target, then they will include into uh, metabolome, not the normal routine like uh, if you are only looking for cell differentiation protein. So less than 15 uh, kilodalton, they are not going to be uh, called as metabolomic. They are still a part of proteins. But if they, you know, the, the something happened and then okay. they are the cleavage product or the broken metabolite or the um, protein turnover you are looking for, then they are coming to I see. And so ultimately it just goes back to the identification process and the bioinformatics of, mm -hmm. of the ID. Thank you. You're welcome.